Welcome back to UCS TV viewers. Chris Nichols here again from the camera store. And as you can see, we're not in Calgary. We're actually outside the Dome. You can probably hear it as well. We're here in the city of Cullen, beautiful city for Photokina 2016. It's been an amazing event. And tonight we're going to hit the streets, do some shooting with the brand new Panasonic G85. Now, keep in mind here in Europe, it is called the G80, but back home it's going to be the G85. But the review will apply to both, of course. A very exciting brand new Micro Four Thirds camera. You guys know how much I love these. I'm going to go outside here, take some shots, and put it through its paces. But even better, you guys at home are getting two for one today because we're not just looking at the G85, Jordan's actually shooting on the brand new FZ2500. We'd like to thank Panasonic just off the bat for letting us have both of these cameras nice and early to go shoot the streets. He's going to be videotaping on this amazing camera as well. We're going to be talking about that. Stills for me and video for him, so come with us. I want you guys to just take a second and look in the frame and just see the beautiful marvel of human engineering, the design, the passion that went into making the Panasonic G85 here. No, I'm just you. I mean, obviously look at the dome. It's beautiful. It's stunning. And in fact, the Panasonic G85 right off the bat, of course, the first thing you notice, it looks like every other G camera and they're not very beautiful cameras. So not a looker, just boring, flat black, SLR like as usual. But Hopefully very functional, hopefully very practical. Now, of course, earlier you may have seen us review the Panasonic GX85, and that camera is very interesting because it added a lot of nice features, such as a brand new 16 megapixel sensor without aliasing filter, as well as a new image stabilization in the body system. It was very, very effective. We liked a lot of things about that camera, but there were a lot of things we were lacking as well. Although the video was high quality, there was no mic jack, and that's a big letdown. So now that we've got the larger body of the G85, we can fit in some of those features that were missing. We've got a mic jack here, which is fantastic. The GX85 did amazing video, but no mic jack. Also, we've got the flippy screen. The larger body lets us do that. And we're also going to have a nice big viewfinder on top. So the G85 is going to put itself in that position where it can be a little bit more camera as long as you're okay with the larger size. So as I've said, the body isn't really inspiring, but we do have a very solid grip. I mean, it feels fantastic on my hand here. I'm not really touching anything I don't want to. The buttons are all in the right position. I love the double dials here. The other thing I'm noticing too is the viewfinder. Over the G7, which is its predecessor, this now has a 0.74 times magnification, and yet it's a very large screen. I'm not getting tunnel vision. I feel like I'm right in the action. It's really nice to look at and very, very clear. Now another thing we have here with the dual dials, we've got the custom button there as usual, that's always handy. And I notice that it's very, very stiff now on these dials. Panasonic doesn't use a locking knob, but I have no concern that these are going to move out of place without me doing it on purpose. Now to go along with this bigger body, as you can see here, I do have the battery grip here on the bottom as well, the BGG1, I believe, and I know what you're saying. Chris, you hate battery grips, why are you using it? And that's true, but we do get the nice double dials on here as well, and we do get to put in a second battery, and I kind of want to talk about that here for a moment. Now, of course, the one big downside with mirrorless cameras has always been battery life, and yeah, the Panasonic cameras have always done a better job of that, but you're still looking at 330 shots on a battery, and actually the G85 is no different. However, I am rocking the grip, I've got the extra battery in there, and there's also a very unique power saving mode on the G85. This is brand new. So I can go in here and I can shut down the screen for an auto sleep kind of mode. You can set it for, you know, multiple seconds. I believe three is the quickest amount of time. But if you do that, when you bring the camera up to your eyes, as long as you got everything turned on properly for the EVF, it will reactivate. And so you can effectively walk around with the camera in power saving mode. Panasonic says up to 800 shots on a full battery. And I got two in here. Now that might be over optimistic, but at least I'm going to get very comparable to an SLR can deliver. Now one of the things I'm really noticing with the G85 is very, very minimal shutter shock. That was kind of an issue with the G7, but here we're getting a very stable body, very delicate shutter. 
very quiet. So that's always a plus. And on top of that, the G85 has a brand new IBIS system. This is their best that they've ever made. And it's actually even improved over the GX85. I'm going to test just how low I can shoot in shutter speeds and still get sharp pictures next. All right, guys, so I want to test the dual image stabilization. I've got the 12 to 60, which has image stabilization in it. I've got the new and improved stabilization in the body. I'm going to shoot this one handed, not leaning on anything at a quarter of a second and see what I can get. Is it really going to be stable? We're going to find out. Okay, guys, so I took three photos and you can see all three photos here. You know, that's all I took, just the three shots, quarter of a second, handheld, one handed. And you can see all three shots are very, very sharp considering what I'm doing in a quarter of a second here. So this brand new inbuilt stabilization, I'm gonna give it an A plus, it's fantastic. It's really holding the camera steady, along with that quiet, nice stable shutter. We really do have a nice low light camera and I'm gonna need it because it's starting to get dark out here. Autofocus on the JD5, you've heard this from me before, Panasonic's DFD is just the best ever. It focuses so fast, point to point, I've never seen a camera faster than that. I'm just going to go ahead and say that right now. And uh, other things that they've improved for speed, they're now up to 9 frames per second. That's one over the G7, and of course that is without continuous autofocus. Kick the continuous autofocus on, you're getting 6 per second, but again, that's still pretty respectable. And buffer rate on top of that also improved. This is now up to UHS-2 on the SD card, single slot only, but you're going to get something like 60 RAW, just over 60 RAW in a row, and well over 300 JPEGs. This is fantastic. This camera can shoot and shoot and shoot. I think you'll be pleased with the speed this camera can deliver. As you guys know, I like to use a Panasonic GM5. It's a much smaller body, really harnessing the advantage of the smaller Micro Four Thirds sensor. One of the advantages though of going to a larger body like this on the G85 is I do get a more rugged appearance and I do get weather sealing, which is a nice benefit. Of course, that larger size also means that I can't use my classic small mirrorless mover bag. I've got to go to something else. So I decided to bring, you guessed it, my official TCS TV bag my butterfly bag, or I guess in German that would be uh, Schmetterling Tasha. Now we did our GX85 review. It's funny because on the internet everybody was talking about this being an amazing vlogging camera, probably because of the inbuilt stabilization in the 4K, but we found that without a mic jack or flippy screen, it just wasn't ideal for that. We actually preferred the older G7. But now, of course, that I've got the G85 and I'm recording right now on it here, it's working out great. We've got the new image stabilization for you know holding one hand and pointing at me here nice and stable. We've also got the flippy screen, and I can set those custom buttons on the touch screen to really make it easy to set things like ISO and white balance very, very quickly. So overall now, I'm going to say that the G85 is a much better vlogging tool. Now, you all know that I love my touch screens, and of course the JD5 has got a fantastic interface, but what I do like on the newer cameras is not only can I move my autofocusing point around on this screen, but when I have my eye up to the viewfinder, I can still move it around with my finger, get my thumb in there, change my focusing point around. I love that. It was one of my favorite features on the Nikon D5500. Of course, with the larger body too, there's no risk that my finger is going to slip over here and hit the screen. It just doesn't happen, although my nose has tapped right over here a couple times. All right, guys, so I'm going to talk about the video capabilities on the JD5, and I know you're already upset because you'd rather have Jordan, but it's okay. He's going to do the FZ2500's capabilities, and remember, he's shooting me on that camera right now. And I think I can handle this because there's not much that's really changed here on the JD5. We've got the standard 4K capabilities here, nice manual controls. We now have the flippy screen and the mic jack, which is a big improvement over the GX85. Uh, no headphone jack, guys, sorry. You're still going to have to go to a GH4 if you want to have the headphone for audio monitoring. Uh, you are going to get unlimited record time on the G85, which is the Canadian, North American kind of version. But unfortunately, here in Europe, where we are right now, you're not going to get that unlimited record time. Otherwise, though, overall, guys, this is one of the best video cameras for under a grand. And uh, it just handles well. It's nice quality, a really, really good package. Now, making its return, you do have the 4K photo modes as usual, but they've added something very interesting now. Before, on the earlier Panasonics, we had post-focus, but all you could really do is decide, do I want thin depth of field or everything in focus? And that was it. Now, here on the JD5, I can actually select the focusing zones that I want to have in focus and really control my depth of field after the fact of taking the shot. Now, keep in mind, you are going to be limited to 8 megapixels, and you got to hold the camera fairly steady for about a second and a half while it takes the shots for focus stacking, but it is a neat feature and it does give us some creative control over depth of field after we've taken the picture. I'll tell you guys one thing, when the Panasonic JD5 stays in Cologne, it stays at the IBIS Hotel because of its in-body image stabilization.
That was stupid. Jordan, your jokes are stupid. I'm not doing it. Don't put it in the video. All right, I just want to throw something out here. Uh, the G85 is actually doing a very good job focusing in this very dim light. Now, granted, I got a 42.5, 1.7 on here, but still, I'm sure you guys can hear this. Even in this dim light, looking in the dark areas where we don't have really any background light, it's still doing a really good job. I'm sure you can hear it there. All right, guys, well, as you can see, it's quite dark outside, and I'm also starting to lose my voice, so I'm choosing now to shut up and uh, go take some photos here in low light. I am interested to see what we're gonna get. I don't think we're gonna be surprised here. It is still a micro four thirds sensor, and I have a feeling the camera's gonna have a hard time as we start to push the ISO, but there's only one way to find out. I'm gonna see you guys tomorrow. All right, so it's day two, and we did have a lot of fun night shooting last night, but you know, looking at the image quality here, guys, no surprises, it's micro four thirds. That is still the weakness of the smaller sensor. And as you take a look at our ISO ramp up here, checking out low light examples, we get the characteristic softness as you get up into high ISOs. That's just one of the things you're gonna have to deal with a micro four thirds sensor. So fast aperture glass is a big bonus. Try to be steady. And again, with the image stabilizer on this camera, maybe keep the shutter speed slower if you can get away with it and avoid pushing that ISO too high. All right, guys, we're just playing with the resolution here. Now, we've seen this result already in the GX85, and this is no difference. The G85's got the 16 megapixel sensor without aliasing filter. And first off, what we found is even though you've got cameras like the GX8 with a 20 megapixel sensor, we find that this 16 megapixels without the aliasing filter resolves basically the same way. So very, very impressive results for resolution. I've compared the shot here against my own GM5, which is the 16 megapixel sensor with the aliasing filter and again you'll see on a tripod a noticeable improvement in resolution remember that if you're hand holding this camera the results aren't going to be as amazing but still it's a nice little kick taking that filter away and moiré any sort of strange patterning doesn't seem to be a problem you know all in all I really like the Panasonic G7. I thought it was one of the best all-around cameras that money could buy, great value. And now the G85 is really continuing that tradition. I mean, again, the camera's got a few downsides. The low-light performance still isn't gonna blow anybody away, and that is just the issue with Micro Four Thirds. But overall, it's a fast camera. They've improved the shooting rate. Autofocus is still probably the fastest I've ever used on a camera. I mean, this camera can certainly handle many different kinds of photography. Now the GH5 has been announced here at Photokina as something that's coming out. We still don't know a lot of specs, but you know, I imagine we're gonna get the latest 4K capabilities. We're probably gonna get a higher resolution sensor. We'll have to wait to see. But undoubtedly the GH5 is gonna be very much a specialized pro camera, and I'm sure it's gonna be definitely more pricey than this one. So I still think the G85 is a fantastic successor to the G7. It's just providing you such a solid all-around camera. You cannot go wrong with this. I really enjoyed it here today, and I hope you guys enjoy learning about the camera again don't forget to tweet us with any questions or comments you have check out our instagram feeds we took a lot of photos here in germany today and uh, don't forget to subscribe to us you know we're pumping these videos on a regular basis and we'd love to see you guys coming back every week to find out what we're doing next Hey, it's Jordan to talk about the video on the FZ2500 that I used to shoot this episode. Now, I should mention as well, Chris is shooting on the G85 right now, so pay attention, especially in terms of dynamic range, you can get an idea of what this camera is capable of. Now, the FZ2500 is the replacement to the 1000, which is a camera I really liked, but not a few things that really held it back. And they've changed those on the body here, which I really love. For starters, we now have a two, four, and six stop ND filter built right in with a clickable switch. So it's very fast and easy to work with, more like a camcorder. Now, one thing I really like about the body that they've changed on the 2500 is you can see the zoom ring does extend when you power the camera up, but then as you zoom, everything happens internally. I'm zooming right now. Uh, now this is great because you don't have the weight shift forward, uh, which is really nice when you're balancing your camera. But also the FZ1000 was a little bit notorious when you got to the long end of it. You could get a little bit of wobble and bounce in your video. It was really distracting, so that's completely controlled in this. 
Now as well, you've got your focus and zoom rings on it. I really like that they actually feel a bit different. So I could tell when I was shooting late last night when my hand was on the focus ring and when it was on our secondary ring here. It's a really useful feature and it drove me crazy on the RX-10 III. I never really knew which ring my hand was on. This is a big difference and it makes it a lot more usable. Now let's talk about the lens a little bit because that's one of the best things about the 2500. It is a huge zoom range, a 24 to 480 millimeter equivalent full frame zoom. Now remember, if you shoot 4K on this camera, it actually uses the central portion of the sensor, giving you a pretty big crop. So we have a 36 to 720 equivalent lens at that point. Now 36 is a little bit restrictive, especially when we're shooting on the street. Sometimes I wanted a wider lens to take in more of the cathedrals, the environment around Chris. And 36 I found a little bit tight, but remember you do win on the telephoto end. If you're planning to use this a lot for wildlife, things like that, that crop factor could actually help you out. Now this is a variable aperture lens, which kind of drives me crazy. If I reframe the shot slightly, things are going to get darker, things are going to get brighter, and it gets dark very quickly. So keep that in mind. This is not a great low light lens, and because it's a one inch sensor, I found we really fought with that last night. A couple other really nice improvements we've seen over the FZ1000 is we now have a headphone jack, so I can actually monitor my audio. Makes this a great A cam. As well, they've given us 120 frame per second recording at 1080, so you can do some nice slow-mo with it. And unlike a lot of cameras, there's not too much more A aliasing, although it does get a little bit soft, but quality is quite good on this. Now, in terms of image quality, we do get very, very sharp image on this, as we'd expect with Panasonic, but I fought with a couple things. For starters, the low light on this camera, we were shooting a lot at 1600 ISO, and because this lens does slow down very quickly, almost all of it was on the wide angle, but still, I did find we get quite a bit of noise in the shadow, and I had some real issues where the peaking will read that noise as detail, which led to a couple of misfocused shots, like you can see here. Other thing I really wrestled with was dynamic range on this camera. Now, that's because we're using the standard profiles, and one thing that's really exciting is they are gonna make V-Log available for this camera. Now, it will be a separate purchase, but in these high contrast scenes, it's a great thing to have access to. I love V-Log when we shoot with the GH4. It's really cool that they're giving it that flexibility. Now, one reason I love super zooms for travel video like we're doing right now is you've got an all-in-one zoom range, but you also get great stills and excellent video capabilities. And Panasonic is really focusing on making this a camcorder replacement because you have no record limit on it, at least in terms of the North American version. Sorry, Europeans, but uh, you're out of luck. Uh, but we can shoot all day until either your battery fills up or your card fills up. It's really great, and helping you with that is that the battery life on this is fantastic. I've shot this entire video on a single battery, and I still have about a third of a battery left. So that's really excellent for this kind of stuff. You don't have to carry around a lot of extra accessories. At the end of the day, I really do think this is such a well-rounded all-in-one camera. It does have some limitations, but in terms of dynamic range, that's getting addressed shortly. I really want to do a full review of this, and I really want to shoot it out against some of the Sony Super Zooms, so you guys can stay tuned for that coming up soon. Remember, definitely subscribe, and we'll check out the 2500 later when we get a full production version.